All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is the first, the very first webinar that I do in English. And right now I feel a little bit nervous. Um, and yeah, here we are. We have our beautiful guest, uh, Phuong Nguyen. Did I say your name right? Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I was wondering, is it Phuong or Phuong or something else, you know? <laughs> oh, no. All right. So um, uh, I think I saw, I never met Fung in person, but uh, I hope one day we will. But I saw you in the group of um, Asian art therapists, and it's an online group uh, created by this um, Japanese American art therapist uh, in Berlin. And I was so, uh, I was so thrilled. I was so happy to see, oh, there's another uh, Vietnamese art therapist out there. And we're super, super happy. And um, so I, I, I texted you, right? And I said, hey, would you like to connect? And would you like to, uh, yeah, maybe we do um, uh, a live talk um, and introducing our therapy to Vietnamese audience. And uh, thank you for being here, Phuong. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad you reached out to me. Um, we were chatting a bit earlier and I don't really know any other Vietnamese <laughs> This outside of myself. Um, so I'm always interested in to like how this translate in different countries, contexts, settings, cultural values. Um, yeah, thanks for reaching out to me. Yeah, speaking of culture, I'm still navigating. I'm j I just came back from the US like um, six months ago. And, um, you know, let's talk more about later, we can talk more about, you know, how we use our therapy with different um, people from different backgrounds and uh, different cultural contexts and, and so on. But before that, let's introduce you. Would you like to introduce yourself? You, it doesn't have to be kind of like the boring uh, reading your, your bio kind of thing. It could be however you want to introduce yourself. What's important to you? What, what's, uh, what are you passionate about? And where are you living? Maybe that too. Right, um, we can start from there. So. Again, my name is Blue. I am an artist and art therapist from Toronto, Canada. Um, and I work with mostly people of color in Canada. Um, and that's kind of where the main scope of my work is. Um, mm -hmm. I was born and raised here. And what else did I do? I just, that's, that's kind of all I do. <laughs> A lot of painting, art, and um, reading, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I've been really tired of COVID. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to like the warmer weather, the warmer months here in Canada. It's, as you know, it, it gets pretty cold. April is still um, not the warmest month. Yeah. But um, that's what I'm looking forward to, right? Okay. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay. Just want to double check. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um. Yeah. So, what what brought you? Uh, where are you in Toronto? Uh, in in Canada? Is, are you in Toronto? Yeah, I'm in Toronto. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Not too just like north of New York, which is where you studied, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I lived in. I think, I think I told Fuang earlier that I, I had, um, I spent uh, three months in Toronto in 2016. Um, yeah, and uh, it was super cold. It was from the end of October until um, say February. And I remember it was so, so cold. I definitely had some sort of episodes of depression just because it was so cold. Anyway, so yeah, Fuang, what, uh, what brought you to art therapy? And yeah. Um, um, yeah. So I, I'm sorry that you spent the cold months here. Uh, that those are the worst months to spend, I think, in Canada. Um, so I guess to start off on how I ended up here, I started off as an artist. I went to mm -hmm. school for drawing and painting at OCAD. Um, and I, I made a lot of work about, I guess, identity politics, social justice, mm -hmm. but working within the art world, there was a lot of money involved in it, as expected. I feel like artists do have to make a living and deserve to make a living. Um, but 
I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was making the impact that I want to make with my artwork. At the end of the day, I still have to sell and worry about the art market and the dealers and the galleries and like also like not really enough time to focus on the art that I was making because of these mm. overhanging um, elements, I guess, in practice. So later on, I had um, a family member of mine experience um, some quite my family and I a lot of like Vietnamese communities in Canada have a really hard time understanding mental health and um, not only understanding it but how to how to help how to talk about it mm -hmm. um, and it becomes really really difficult um, to find help in maybe or un, um, unintentionally stigmatizing family mm -hmm. environment so I got more interested in art therapy um, because I feel I felt like I could make more of a direct impact on my community as a whole. Um, but I guess to provide some context, there's quite a bit of trauma that has been passed down through generations through immigrant, refugee, newcomer experiences here in Canada and Toronto. Um, it's a huge, huge, and beautiful, lovely um, immigrant population. I believe that the majority of people here are um, people of color, so non-European peoples in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are quite new, like recent immigrants. Um, and there's quite a bit of, there's uh, a lot of lack of being able to talk about and understand mental health because there are other priorities. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are kind of worried about surviving, making rent, finding a decent right. job, worrying about our kids, exactly. worrying about mm -hmm. our kids' education, and it, um, it really does kind of get passed down. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about mental health is not high up on the priority list. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> um, and that's part of the reason I got into it. Um, I went to go study in Vancouver, so that's on the other side of the country, and I guess to give some context, it's about three hours of time difference, time zones away, oh, maybe five okay. hour flight from me to Vancouver, um, and I moved over there to study art therapy, one, because I wanted to, a break from the city a little mm -hmm. bit, um, Vancouver is a much smaller city, um, and with, surrounded by a lot of beautiful, natural landscape uh -huh. um so i spent a lot of time hiking being in nature and learning more about the community there as well um and to put it in like a different context vancouver is quite diverse as well mm -hmm. um it has a big population of um chinese immigrants that have been there for over 100 years mm -hmm. um it has a quite a large indigenous native population to canada um, and other, um, I believe there's quite a bit of the Indian population as well that dates as far back as have settled there as long as the Chinese population did. Um, so that's where I worked. I worked um, in addictions mm -hmm. and there's uh, an opioid crisis in Vancouver. That's, I believe it was declared a state of emergency and this year is the fifth year in a row that mm -hmm. that is still happening. Um, Okay. And I, I learned a lot. It was a lot of like learning on the ground level and hitting the ground running. Um, after my training there, I moved back to Canada. Sorry, I've been in Canada. Moved back to Toronto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just feels like two different worlds. Like, yeah, it feels like two different countries. <laughs> Three hours apart. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. So you moved back to Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. Where I sit at my practice. Um, and work with mainly, I think all people of color in my clients, mm -hmm. or clients of color, clients who are people of color. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is the world. <laughs> oh. Wow, oh my gosh, there's, you mentioned, you mentioned a lot of uh, keywords that I was so like excited to, to unpack with you and, and ask you more questions. We talk about, what, like transgenerational trauma and then stigmas and and um, 
uh, yeah, addiction and the practice of art therapy um, with uh, clients of, of colors. And um, yeah, I would like to, to ask you maybe, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the transgenerational trauma that you mentioned. Um, can you help us understand a little bit more? Um, I think the audience, many, many people may not be familiar with that term. And yeah, can, uh, what, what does it mean to you? Um, I, guess, uh, for, I always like to start simple because that's how I understand things. Yeah, um, let's do that. <laughs> that is passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. um, there are some biological factors. So there's a lot of like social economic um, factors as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, a person who might have been a a refugee from another country moving to a place like Toronto, Canada. There's quite a few protective behaviors mm -hmm. that get that is learned and passed on. Um, something like hoarding is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I once worked with a man who lost everything, uh -huh. um, and he um, started hoarding, so holding on to everything. Every Every plastic bag, every, mm. all the, every, like anything he's ever come to own in his possession, he kept. Um, and that kind of passes on to his, he passes on to his kids. Right. Because this is something that they're from their parents. Um, the, the anxiety of losing things. Um, so I guess that's, that's one piece of that came to mind first. Yeah. Um, of course, it manifests in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, there's a, quite a bit of that um, here, and I think that contributes to the stigma of speaking about mental health. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Mm. Let's 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 dive deeper into that. What what do you ha what have you noticed personally and and professionally? Um, what is blocking people, especially Asian people, in um, North America to, or in, I mean, I guess um, you never live in, in Asia, so you probably can't speak for, for Asian people in, in the whole Asia, but um, yeah, what do you think the stigmas are uh, for Asian people when it comes to seeking mental health uh, support? And um, yeah, hmm. I'm kind of curious to know more. <laughs> Me too, it's always something to, to learn. Um, the two that come to mind, we talked about generational trauma and how that gets passed down and um, how talking about one's personal issues and personal mental well-being might be quite difficult for someone of Asian descent in North America because them, if they're recent immigrants themselves or their parents, have other priorities to focus on. Um, how can I worry about how I'm feeling if I'm looking like I'm concerned about the next meal? or I'm worried about rent, or, or my parents are worried about this and that. Um, so a lot of people take the responsibility and burden on themselves to kind of protect the people around us from our own feelings. Um, I don't want my parents to worry that I'm feeling this way, or I don't want them to know that I'm struggling because they have so much to worry about already. Um, and also there's, this, um, I feel like the model minority myth plays a big factor and what that is, is it is the the stereotype the prejudice that Asian or peoples of Asian descent um, specific are hardworking, they have their life together, they um, don't make um, there are no uh, they don't make like big um, you're not trouble. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're good. They're good workers, and that's, and um, they're smart, and they they don't struggle. Um, so that prejudice, that stereotype, is quite harmful because at some point you learn to believe it, and you learn to internalize that. Um, I'm not supposed to be struggling. My like people like me don't struggle, and when you believe some of that, you internalize some of that. Like it's it quite it becomes quite difficult to even talk about struggle or maybe the fact that oh like i'm having a hard time or i'm having a hard time also like academically like in school 
I feel like that becomes a focus of quite a bit of anxiety for um, young people of Asian descent here. Yeah, and um, I like the way you use the words internalize, right? When we don't see, when we internalize the stereotypes that are imposed on us, and it's not even our choice to, to have that kind of, um, to submit to those stereotypes. And also the, the fact that we don't, we grow up and we don't see a lot of people who look like us, who talk about struggles, right? Yeah, and um, I think that's um, sort of how I, I felt uh, when I was in the US and um, it felt very vulnerable for me to speak in front of a group of, uh, of students who, and nobody looks like me. I was the only Asian student in, um, in, in the whole program. And I feel like if I talk about how Vietnamese people struggle, it feels like I'm whining. And um, yeah, that fear of, oh, I'm taking so much space here. And is it okay, right? It's so normal if I have like a Caucasian friend who talks about the struggles that she goes through. But for me, it's just so not normal. And uh, I wonder where that comes from. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's like quite a few factors. The answer is always complicated. Yeah, it is. It's just, it's, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. It's always very complicated. And um, so how did you, what do you think the, the cost, the cost is, um, or, you know, the impacts of, um, um, of Asians grew, Asians uh, distance in North America when, um, you know, they always kind of have to, or people in general, right? When they have to like hold on to um, that beliefs that, oh, uh, I should not share it. I should not uh, whine, or I should not talk about uh, what's, uh, what I'm struggling with. And uh, I have to kind of hold on to this independent image uh, who's very capable of taking care of myself. So wh what are the costs of that? Oh, sorry, um, I'm gonna speak louder. Is this, is this better? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. <laughs> um, I, my voice is quite low. It is pretty quiet. Um, could you repeat the question? I got a bit distracted. Yeah, what, what, is, <laughs> what is the cost, um, you know, what's the, what are the impacts when somebody kind of have to hold on to that image of, oh, the, um, you know, powerful me, the independent me, I don't need to ask for help. I should not ask for help. I should not take space. I should not express my struggles. Hmm. It's a bit dehumanizing, isn't it? To um, not allow ourselves to have help. Um, or to accept help or to ask for help. Um, and that's kind of the big thing when we feel stigmatized and when we stigmatize ourselves, um, we are keeping ourselves from reaching out or asking for help and or keeping ourselves from growing and being better. Um, and not only that, but that kind of, uh, depending on who we are, that might set a bad example for our generations after us to not reach out for help and not to feel and be better. Um, sometimes when we prioritize other people's feelings about ourselves over our own feelings about ourselves, um, we kind of forget that we're someone worth caring about, if that makes sense. It's a bit of, um, so it's, it's quite important to, but also, like I, I recognize that we don't all live in supportive communities yeah. um, that are willing to hear us out and not willing to, to help us, but willing to be allies mm -hmm. um, rather than us asking for help and receiving it. I feel like that's a very transactional and a, there's an imbalance of power there. Mm -hmm. um, but looking, but to, not everyone has a, a supportive community to really um, walk with us to, to feel, to get better, to be better. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, depending on your circumstances, talking about yourself and your own mental health might not always be the safest thing to do. Um, so it's really important for everyone to kind of like evaluate who, where, who their support system are and is there space for this here? And if not, how else can I learn to seek help? Mm -hmm. um, it really is about 
seeing ourselves as someone worth caring about and what and practicing that mm -hmm. yeah. and and i guess also recognizing what is uh, standing in the way between me and my you know my worth and maybe just the fact that i deserve help i deserve uh, to be supported by my community right and when i explore it with my clients sometimes um, most of the time there's like a layer of shame yeah. uh, wrapping around it you know telling them that they don't deserve to take space they don't deserve to get help they don't deserve to be supported by others um, and, and, and also all the stigmas that we have discovered. And so you're talking about like a healthy, uh, a supportive community. What does it look like to you? And have you found yours? <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, and that's something that's always growing and changing as well. Um, a supportive community for me uh, looks like a community that is very accepting, um, that wants the best for you. Mm. And um, it's something that you also contribute to as well. Um, so we talk a lot about community care and self-care in my practice. Um, there's, again, it's, a, I guess, a bit about context. Um, I work with a lot of first-generation and second-generation immigrants. Um, and because there's a lot of emphasis on the struggle of my parents, the struggle of my family, how can I help? How can I make their struggles worth it? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot to take on. <laughs> it's a lot to take on. It's a lot of responsibility for one person to make that feel worth it, whatever mm -hmm. that means. Um, and sometimes we forget that we are a part of the community that we want to serve. Um, and by taking care of ourselves, we do take care of our community. Um, and that's, it's easy to lose sight of that. Um, but I feel like learning to admit that, is a really good step towards, okay, maybe I can help as a part of a whole. It's quite empowering sometimes. Um, uh oh, okay. Oh, can you hear me okay? I think my internet is a little bit, uh, You're muted. Oh, sorry, my internet was um, a little bit funny today. And yeah, but I heard you talking about uh, when we take care of ourselves, we're also taking care of our community. Uh, I mean, I think the past year, the past two years when I was in the US, I learned that concept. I, But it was like so weird. It was for somebody who was 28 years old, like me, who came to the US. And it was the first time I realized that it is okay to take care of myself. <laughs> and I went through, you know, a, a, a period of rage and anger because why didn't, why didn't anybody tell me this? Right? Why didn't anybody tell me I was worth it? Like, where's the, uh, the self care that I can provide myself? So, what do you think about that? Um, you know, the idea of, of self care? What, what does that mean to you? And is it is it like going to spa or you know putting on uh, like a mask, um, a cool mask at the end of the day, or yeah, what is it? What what else about self care? What's yeah, beyond as, it? <laughs> as nice as that as that sounds, um, I don't know about um, you guys overseas, but here like self care has been really commodified and mm -hmm. capitalized on. Um, uh, a lot of people are trying to sell like self-care items, mm. um, like taking a bubble bath or taking like the mask or a spa day or whatever that means. But I, again, like to, I, simple as the way I understand it, um, it is taking care of yourself, whatever that might mean. 
And sometimes that means doing the dishes the night before so, because you'll regret it in the morning. And taking care of your future self is really important as taking care of your present self as well. Um, sometimes that means cleaning the house because you deserve to live in a clean space. Sometimes that means eating better because your body deserves a bit more love than, than what you're currently eating. Um, it doesn't always mean like taking a luxurious hedonist kind of day off, even though maybe that's what, again, maybe that is what you need, but it doesn't all, it's not always what you need. Um, sometimes self-care is doing the hard thing mm -hmm. because sometimes the hard thing is what's actually the loving thing for you. Like, like asking for help, right? Uh, getting support. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The hardest um, thing in the world. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh yeah, for mm. sure. Um, before I started the art therapy program, I don't, I don't know what was wrong with me, but I came in thinking, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> but it wasn't that way at all. Like three months in, it's like, no, I'm not fine. Um, and that's just kind of like part of the process, I think. Yeah. Um, getting over that kind of like strange delusion of like no you're mm. not okay <laughs> i guess i guess we needed that you know that kind of narrative or that um uh false uh, or illusional strength yeah but it helps at cope uh for so many years right including myself i do remember um you know crying in my trauma class oh my gosh i was traumatized it's so funny now talking about it but yeah i feel a lot um I'm very appreciative of uh, the, that program, the art therapy program that I went through. It was so life-changing. It was mm -hmm. super hard. Yeah, like this, what you said, right? Um, finally, I could be closer to this um, maybe more authentic part of myself and um, even making peace with the fact that, oh, I didn't feel okay for, for so long and, um, and how, how precious it is that I now I'm aware of it. And I could even name it. I could even say that, oh, I wasn't okay. And uh, yeah, that's beautiful. That's, that's really empowering. You know, like that, I wasn't okay and that's okay. Yeah, and that's <laughs> okay. It will be fine, I'll, yeah. I will work on it. Yeah. Um, I'm not okay and that's okay. Yeah. It definitely shook me a little bit um, mm -hmm. because Toronto and Vancouver culturally are also very different. There's quite a bit of a fast pace here. Um, if I wonder if you like experience very similar things as well being in the states, but like there's three things to do at the same time at all times. Um, if you're traveling somewhere, I guess you're having lunch on the train because you're not going to have time to have lunch um, doing anything else or listening to a podcast or like they're all like might as well make use of my time like there's a lot of go 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 here right right yeah. and it's quite romanticized this burning out it's quite mm -hmm. romanticized it's like oh they work so hard or like they're such a hard worker yeah. um or like i work so hard for this <laughs> like it's, it's quite romanticized yeah it um, is and i wonder if that has to do with kind of um like making like our experiences um coming from a very uh like large immigrant community like mm -hmm. we have to make our time worth it we have to make their time worth it i'm going to work really hard and there's a lot of yeah romance and burning out um exactly but going to vancouver the, pa the pace is so slow in a very at first it was painful for me it's like <laughs> my coffee isn't ready in one minute i have to wait 10 minutes for a coffee it was quite difficult for me um but it really forces changing environments really forces you to look and reflect on yourself i think um like why do i need a coffee ready by the time i pay for it mm -hmm. or why do i need to fit all these things in a day um the west coast has definitely taught me to slow down mm -hmm. a little bit and to just mm -hmm. be a bit more mindful mm -hmm. and made me realize oh i was running on autopilot or i wasn't I wasn't okay <laughs> this whole time. Um, yeah, it's interesting how like a change of context really, really shakes it up a little bit. Yeah, wow, that um, mindfulness, that uh, self-awareness, right? It sounds so delicious. It sounds so beautiful. But you know what? It sounds, it's, it probably me five years ago or even three years ago would say it's impossible. 
I can never, I could never imagine me being who I am today. And, um, and I'm really proud of her, how far I've, I've, you know, I've come on my path. And, um, and let's, let's go back to that, you know, self-care, the idea of self-care and how is, um, you know, how is, uh, how is this uh, in support of community care? So when you say community care, can you share a little bit more um, towards that direction, what, what it means to you? And uh, would you like to share a little bit about the community that you're in? Com does community means um, like uh, people you, who live around you or do they have to be like in-person kind of community or can they be maybe like a different, I don't know, online community, especially during COVID? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it totally could be um, all the things at once or many different kinds of community for one person. Um, when I talk about community care, I, I talk a bit about it, one, on the individual level, mm -hmm. um, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but really about like self-care as community care, um, taking care of yourself because you are a part of a larger community. Um, and that kind of really focuses on that but also community care in terms of yes recognizing you're a part of this community how can you contribute as well um beyond caring about yourself which is important we just talked about that not to not to brush that off mm -hmm. um what kind of community organizations can you become a part of um, how can you support another person in your community in the same, in um, the same way you might have noticed that you might need support as well? Mm -hmm. um, and just being mindful of the people who are part of your ecosystem, mm -hmm. and by community, it it could mean people you live around, depending. Um, I love all my neighbors, most of them. <laughs> um, it could be an online community. Um, I find that a lot of young people, teens, maybe look online for a community when they don't feel accepted in their own um, because there's, it's infinite. There's so many niches, there's so many interests. Um, what someone might not feel safe in their family or in their neighborhood or in their town or their city um, and might need to find um, people to connect with that are supportive online. That's not always the case. I feel like there's a lot of, um, mindfulness that needs to come with navigating the online space like who's really there for you who is genuinely supportive and who is harmful um and yeah my own community um i'm surprisingly like this is probably the most amount of vietnamese people i've been around in a really long time um, i don't really know many people who are vietnamese i grew up pretty multiculturally um so it's not necessarily like the Vietnamese community here for me. It's, yeah, it's my family who try their best and I feel like I can um, be grateful for that. It is my, my artist community. Um, I work in a, paint, a painting studio. Um, so I have, or maybe not right now because of COVID, but I have my friends who are artists, who are practicing artists. Um, to paint around and to work around, get input from, get to be supported by. Um, and I have my friends who are from different parts of the country. So that's, we connect online. So it's a lot of friendship for me. It's been a big part of my community um, as well as like um, participating in um, communities that are outside of my geographical location. Um, Toronto is home to quite a few pockets of um, culture. There's two. There's a Chinatown, Koreatown, Little Tibet, Little India, um, Portugal, Little Portugal, Italy, Greek Town. There's like any a lot of a lot of different um, um, pockets of different heritage and ethnicities. Um, and I've been, I guess, lucky enough to be able to to pop in on some communities and to learn more about it. Um, so it's something that's always kind of growing and expanding. Um, I recently did a workshop for, um, there's a neighborhood in Toronto called the Jane Finch community. Um, and it is 
probably um, the one that has been struggling economically, social economically. Um, I believe it's one of the most violent neighborhoods in the city, which is not might not be a lot for um, like American standards, but for Canadian standards, it's it can be quite um, rough. Um, but that was that's where I was born and raised, so I was recently reached out to participate um, at the Jane Finch Community Center um, and to contribute that way as an adult, which is kind of full circle for me. That was a really great moment that I hold pretty close to me. Um, yeah, Aww. I feel like I rambled a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's, it sounds really interesting. And thank you for sharing about your some of your communities. It sounds like you're very resourceful and um, it's, it's, you're still like branching out, you're still building your other communities. And um, I think that's a very interesting concept as well. And I do notice how that has um, been, um, you know, maybe not the trend, but what I have observed in um, among the Vietnamese audience, the Vietnamese um, young generation that I'm serving. And I do know this how people are also like building their own communities and not just uh, having their own friendships, uh, friend circles, or relying on family support. And uh, that's really wonderful. And I myself, that's what I, I think that's what I love about New York when I was there is that you could find literally every like support group for anything and it was so cool it was so cool they were so resourceful and um you know groups happened almost like every day you could just go to different groups uh, different finding your own communities of people and um yeah that i think that's one of the things i really like about new york city um, finding your own tribe finding you know yoga people writing meditations or, um, you know, Zen uh, Buddhism uh, practice group. And yeah, it was so wonderful uh, when I was in New York. Um, and I also like how you kind of said, Ameri according to American standard, it's like, and, uh, and Canadian standards. <laughs> That's so cool. That's funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow, I have so many things I would like to know, but uh, I want to make sure that people have space so they can ask a few questions. If you guys have any questions, please just uh, type it in the chat box. I think um, uh, for now, I would love to maybe ask Fung to just share one of her art practices or as a self-care um, you know, tool for people to take away and uh, yeah. Is there anything you would like to share with people? Um, yeah, I have um, some things with me. I got two awesome. notebooks. Okay. Um, one is a journal. So journaling has been a big part of my self-care kind of process routine. Um, and I write it by hand, which is kind of important for someone like me because I feel like my, my thoughts are racing whenever I'm in like a certain mindset that I'm struggling with. So writing things by hand really forces me to, to slow down and to be mindful and careful of the words that I'm choosing. Um, a part of me is like, have, has to do with like efficiency, which isn't like the greatest thing um, to, to choose like the right words for what I mean to say. Um, and I don't do it on the regular. I do it as on an as need basis, but I feel like quite a lot of people benefit who benefit from having a steady routine. Um, this is a great, way to like check in with yourself in the morning or set intentions for the morning or to decompress and process what's happened at the end of the day. Um, there's something really powerful for me about putting things into words because I'm a very visual person as like an art therapist. Um, I don't often get the chance to put my own feelings into words. Uh, so that's very, that, that's been very helpful for, uh, helpful for me. Um, and I also brought my sketchbook. I think as a practicing artist, it's kind of important to have an ongoing one. Um, but in terms of wellness and mental health and art therapy, um, I will encourage one as well. Um, it's full of things that I collect over time, um, some quotes, um, and just things that might have interested me. Um, that you might flip through collages, drawings, um, practice paintings, things like that. Um, it's 
and um, idea development as well. But what I like about this in terms of wellness is that um, it gives you some time to, or it gives you a place to look back on old pages, old drawings, old whatever, and um, forces you to take some time and look at it in a way that it's kind of like self-research or arts-based self-research, I guess. Um, it's like, what I have this thing here. What, what was I thinking back then? Or what was going on in my life that I was drawing this insanely depressing drawing? Or like, oh, hey, look at all these colors. That was a great time in my life. Or like, um, what was going on with me at that moment? And hopefully provide some insight as to where you are now. Um, I call it research. But it's very, because of like the casual nature of it, it, it is very organic um, in the way that it grows and the way that it changes. Yeah. I think I learned, sorry, I'm interrupting. I think I learned a, a really great word. It's called me search. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's, uh, I think I learned it from um, Linda Tai, who is one of my favorite. She's a Vietnamese Australian um, uh, trauma therapist who's living in Alaska. And I really, really like her. And um, yeah, she encourages people to do the me search and yeah, researching on yourself. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, so we're, um, I really love journaling as well. And I, uh, I, I resonate with what you shared um, at first at the beginning of my uh, say healing journey or more like going inward journey. I journal every day, twice a day, but slowly I think I'm used to, I got used to like sitting with my thoughts and I don't need to like journal every, you know, every time I observe something. And so I think slowly I have that, um, you know, built up that muscles the ability to, to sit with and observe and not like just act, like react instantly. And uh, that was wonderful. And now I, I also journal whenever I feel the need to, the need to maybe like organize some thoughts or um, just observing the words that I choose. And um, yeah, sketchbook is really amazing as well. And uh, yeah, I was so like, oh my God, your sketchbook is so organized and, and pretty. Oh, I always felt the opposite. Um, it's always, I feel like it's just very like uh, messy for, for me, but I'm a pretty chaotic person okay. in general. So. Okay, jo join my club. All right. Hmm. Um, it's so, it's so um, you know, relieving, like um, admitting that you're a chaotic person. Uh, on the internet <laughs> as a therapist yeah we're not all organized and you know figure it all out like what society thinks yeah for sure we're for human sure. exactly and let's spend the last 15 minutes um on q a is there anything you would like to ask Fung about or is there anything you would like to learn more about Fung? or you can just simply share um have you enjoyed um you know the conversations um, yeah, feel free to ask questions, everyone. All right. Oh, well, there's a questions for you. Yeah, um, that that is literally me. <laughs> um, so, would you like to read it? Would you like to just just oh, yeah. read it out loud? Yeah, for people who watch the someone, recording. How would someone who hasn't journaled since childhood get started again? Thank you for the reminder. Um, that was. That is me. <laughs> um, my my father wanted to be a writer before the Vietnam War, and when he immigrated over here, um, yes, I did art, but journaling has been lost in my life. Likewise, um, so he forced us to journal as kids, and I created a big aversion to it. I was like, "My dad wants me to do this. I'm not touching it at all." <laughs> um, so journaling was a bit. Um, hard for me to get into, um, mostly because it was at a time where it was difficult for me to accept and understand my own thoughts and feelings. But as an adult, um, getting into it again, I just, how I started was more freeform. It was just like, there's something going on with me today. I'm just gonna write down how I'm feeling and eventually like get to the core of the issue. Um, no expectations, no um, writing standard. Um, and just 
um, to have the goal be about self understanding rather than like quality of writing or um, legibility even. I would say it's um, as an adult, maybe start small if that's scary. If it's scary to get into it, um, maybe start off with a sentence or like, I'm not, or today I'm feeling sad and then see where that goes or and elaborate on that. Or yeah, I would, if it feels big and I feel like this is a good way to approach a lot of things that might feel big or anxiety producing is to start small and if that still feels too big like start smaller yeah i love that takes baby 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 steps right mm. yeah the point is to care for yourself not to threaten yourself or or overwhelm yourself i guess mm. Okay, I think sometimes we can feel guilty about the outcome if it looks like we dumped our feelings on it. Right, right. What do you think? That's actually something interesting mm -hmm. to get into as well. Um, and our, the journal doesn't have any feelings, if that makes sense. You can say like the most heinous things in here and it's not going to judge you. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure, for sure. I, I hope. Mm -hmm. Um, for journaling, I guess it's important to set some time aside for it. And there can be some, a lot of like guilt and shame about setting time aside for your own feelings as well. Um, but I guess the big thing is to just to, to, to start small. Um, mm. And it's totally okay to dump your feelings into it. It has no feeling. It has no judgment. Yes. <laughs> I guess it's better than, not really better, but better than doing it on somebody who didn't ask for it, right? Who's not ready yeah. Uh, or yeah, to take in our yeah, feelings. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the, for the question and for um, yeah. Wonderful questions, thank you. And that is, um, yeah, one of my really, really good friends. So. Anyway, we have a second one. Can you share with me how to be an art therapist? Great questions. I just graduated the major in psychology and I have some interest in art. I want to know more about your experience in art therapy. Can you tell us the thing you appreciate most about your study? Wow. Congratulations. This is so great. Congratulations on graduating Congrats. and finishing your major. Um, that's pretty big. So that's good for you. Um, how to be an art therapist. So it might be different depending on what country you're in. Um, in Canada, you can, um, there's a few master's programs and there's a few diploma programs. Um, both of them are, um, give you certification to, to work as an art therapist. Um, we have a governing body here called the Canadian Art Therapy Association. Um, and they have a list of training programs that, um, that they oversee and consider like the standard for art therapy education. So I think that's important to look into that where you are. Um, my experience in art therapy, did you mean my ex experience in the art therapy program? Or? However you understand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, my experience in, in the art therapy program and in like, getting into like the art therapy world and things like that has been pretty transformative. Um, yeah, okay. So it was admittedly quite difficult for me in the beginning, um, getting in, getting myself started in the art therapy program. One, because I was delusional and I thought I was fine. <laughs> Two, is that um, I come from a very kind of like academic arts background. Um, so I'm used to looking at art and making art in a very critical way, which is the opposite of what art, the purpose of art therapy is, is to not look at the artwork and judge it, but as to look at the artwork and try to understand yourself from it. Um, so that was really difficult for me, um, but the program was fantastic. Um, it was a different setting. So I had a really good look at my like what I was going through and um, things that were, were happening for me but also um it helped me learn looking look at art in a different sort of way in a very different context and 
I'm, I'm a big nerd for things. So the studying was great. The reading thing, like reading papers was great. Writing I'm a bit more insecure about, but um, overall it was, I personally loved it. Um, the most helpful thing was to do my clinical placement. Um, there's a, so much learning you do on like on the ground level, working with clients um, as a student and being open to different demographics and populations and people has was probably the biggest part of my art therapy training and how this kind of shaped my practice. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that's another great question. So we have the last one. Uh, I mean, the second last one. I, I think we have enough time for one more. Uh, would you like me to read the uh, the message or would you like to do that? Um, yeah, I can, I can read it. Um, so, mm -hmm. this, so this one comes from Mac. I have, social, <laughs> I have social anxiety and whenever I'm in Vietnam or abroad, I'm always reserved and very careful of accepting someone steps into my life like in a more close relationship that's why I don't find any community right now and that's kind of for me or belong to and sometimes I feel lost even when there were some groups of people they actually did open up and welcome me to join their communities but anxiety still holds me back so do you have any advice on how to cope with anxieties which mostly oneself creates in this case thank you for your question I feel like it's one, it's great that you know yourself in this way. And I, I feel like understanding kind of how you feel and noticing things as they happen or being able to reflect on what's happened in this way has, is a really good place to start. So you're off, you're off to a good start. Um, social anxieties is so difficult um, to get into because it's scary. It's really scary. A lot of anxieties come from a place of fear um, and I guess what I would suggest um, is to look to a community that you know is safe. You might not be able to be in it just yet, but um, that is welcoming and safe. And again, like the journaling, start really small um, because sometimes the fear and the, and like the anxiety of the fear is bigger than the thing itself. Um, but if from the information that you've given me, I, I would encourage you to start really small, like really, really small, and then move from there without, um, and that's kind of something that I would say because I, I, I don't know you and I don't know the specifics of your situation. Um, but yeah, that would be, that would be the move for, for me to start small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your question and sharing your, you know, very personal story here. Um, I hope, yeah, I hope there is somebody who can support you during this as well. Maybe a professional, an art therapist, or, you know, maybe, um, yeah, maybe a, a mental health professional, like a counselor. Um, I used to work with uh, a client, a few clients who had um, social anxieties and um, they had very severe trauma uh, before they develop anxiety. And, and the anxiety is like, uh, I feel like it's a, it's a way we cope with the world. It's the way that the body, you know, copes with what's happening. And um, yeah, after working for like nine months or a year together, um, some people feel safer in the relationship with the, with the therapist. And then they could actually go out there and um, bring in their own communities. So I guess sometimes it's, uh, it takes time. And um, yeah, and it's okay. Uh, you know, feeling safe is, is uh, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, I think um, I would like to um, welcome one more question before we close the circle today. If anybody else has a question. How are you feeling, Phuong? I just want to check in with oh, you quickly. I'm good. I was nervous in the beginning as well. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm good. Should... All right. How's everyone else in the circle? Um, how's your, your, what's your energy level right now between say zero and 10? Zero is like, you're very tired. Your, your, your energy level is really low and 10 is, is very high. 
So uh, I would say um, around uh, seven is um, 9 p.m. in Vietnam right now. What time is it at, at yours? Ten. I'm not okay. a morning person, yeah. so I'm gonna give myself a good seven as well. <laughs> Thank you for, for making this happen, even though you're not a morning oh, person. You. <laughs> it's one of those things like, I should, I should, mm -hmm. I should, but <laughs> I feel like this was good encouragement to wake up early. So thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, we have another questions that um, somebody sent in from um, the uh, registration form. And um, I think this is a really wonderful question. Um, how can I overcome my self doubt and fear of judgments from other people to follow what I really want? I lost my confidence over time and then my self care. Yeah. That's, that's a big one. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, and I like I like how they pointed out, you know, they lost their confidence over time and then they lose their self-care. Yeah. yeah. Definitely tied. Mm -hmm. um, I would say start with some compassion, I think, for yourself. Um, and losing, I guess, confidence and losing um, self-care as as a consequence mm -hmm. on that is quite interesting because I feel like some of these things inform each other. Um, we talk about self-care as um, also a way of loving yourself and being kind to yourself and compassionate mm -hmm. towards yourself. Um, and starting from there, I hope I would hope that you would learn to love yourself more and be more confident from there um and our behaviors inform our thoughts and our attitudes and our feelings quite often so if it's it's hard to convince yourself to be confident but it's um especially when it seems so daunting and you have something to compare it to but it's maybe we can start off by um doing smaller self-care gestures. Sometimes brushing your teeth in the morning is self-care. Sometimes <laughs> your hair is self-care. Um, so I would say again, start small and then build that up. And I, and I would hope that it would come a bit more easily over time. Mm -hmm. um, if not, that's totally valid too, because it's definitely a practice, but um, starting small and then to the point of, um, recognizing that you are someone worth caring for and someone worth mm -hmm. loving and worthy of your own love um, in whatever form that might be, is um, important to building like self-confidence mm -hmm. as well. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I hope the person is either here or is watching the recording. Um, Thank you so much, Fung. I feel really touched when you mentioned, you know, we are worthy of the love that we have for ourselves. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, it's a hard one to accept for some time. Yes. You know, like mm -hmm. it's fairly simple, but it's hard to accept. Um, and of course, I'm guilty of that too. Um, yeah, and yeah. sometimes we have this black and white um, idea that, okay, our love is like just this small. If I have it for myself, then I can't have it for others. But that's, I don't think that's true in, in my case. I think my love is very vast. It's very big. I can love myself and other people and yeah. my community. Yeah. It's and just, if you're uh, capable of loving other people and you're capable of loving your community, you're capable of loving yourself. Yes. It's already oh. in you, so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so it's 9 p.m. here. And um, yeah, I think we should close the circle today. Um, I don't want to, but yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here, for being so present with us and listening to our conversations and asking wonderful, beautiful questions. And uh, if we want to say, let's say, if we want to ask, uh, people want to follow you or contact you, which is your preferred way to, to be contacted? Yeah, um, I can share my Yes, email. can you type it? <laughs> Thank you. And um, 
yeah, maybe your social media, your professional social media account as well, and your website. From me here that has And if you would like to follow Fum, please um, maybe copy the uh, information and because uh, our Zoom is, is closing soon. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> so Fung's just provided her website. Um, it's called Art Therapy with Fung, uh, P-H-U-O-N-G dot C-A. Art Therapy with Fung dot C-A. And, uh, or you can follow Fung on her professional Instagram account uh, at uh, Art Therapy with Fung. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night or a good morning. Yeah. Yes, have a good night or a good Take morning. Care, Fung. <laughs> thank you for having me. I wish you the best with uh, your art therapy practice and your life and uh, yeah, and your self care and community care in, in oh, Canada. <laughs> All right. Yes. Bye bye. Well, no, I need. <laughs> bye.